Total War Warhammer 3's launch is just around the corner, and there are a lot of different options for campaigns in the base game across Cathay, Demons, Ogres, and Kislev. Altogether, you're looking at a total of 12, see what I did there? Legendary Lords. And with that is quite the decision of which campaign you want to play. In this video series, I'll be giving you a spoiler-free campaign overview to help you decide if it's the right campaign for you. Each campaign will play differently with an emphasis on a particular play style, unit choice, or mechanic. Our next video in this series will highlight the newly revealed and announced Boris Ursus, the hidden legendary lord of Kislev. He leads the Ursan revivalist faction out in the northern portions of the Darklands, beyond the World's Edge Mountains. You'll be able to find the rest of these videos as they're made linked in the playlist in the upper right corner and end of this video. So this is your first time on my channel. The way I do these videos is by giving you a no spoiler breakdown. I'll boot the game up on turn one of the campaign. I'll explain the mechanics of the character in question, show you their skills, quickly show off their research tree, and then give you an overall idea of what the campaign plays like. Keep in mind, this is not a guide, but a quick campaign overview to help you decide which campaign to play when Total War Warhammer 3 launches. Feel free to jump ahead to any part of this video that interests you the most using the chapters noted in the timeline and the description. Before we get started, if you have not yet pre-ordered Warhammer 3 and intend on buying the game, you can support the channel by using the link to my Nexus store. Nexus provides Steam keys directly from the developer and I get a cut of every sale, which helps keep the channel alive. And lastly, if you end up enjoying the content, please don't forget to like, comment, or subscribe. I cannot tell you how much it helps out. But let's get started on the Boris Ursus campaign summary in Total War Warhammer 3. So the first thing I want to talk about in this video is how to unlock Boris Ursus because he is not unlocked by default. And in order to do this, you simply need to play as either Zarina Katarin or as Kosteltian and you'll play through their campaigns. And once you hold Prague, Kislev, and Aringrad, you have to specifically hold it. Doesn't matter if it's in Kislev hands, it has to be in your hands in specific. You hold it for 10 turns, a quest will appear to help release Boris Ursus, and once you do that, you have unlocked Boris Ursus, and he will also be a part of your campaign if you so wish. You can either make him as a, a, a faction that will rove around the campaign, an NPC faction, or you can bring him into yours as a legendary lord you recruit. So, that is how you unlock Boris Ursus for your campaign here in Total War Warhammer 3. Let's move now into the actual video and mechanics. Loading into the campaign here, we're at turn one for Boris Ursus. Now, one thing we have not done in any other video is kind of take a look where Boris starts in the map because he was just revealed today. I do want to show that off a little bit here to you. So he starts in the uh, province of Zorn Uzkul, which is just next to Zar Nagrund over here. So whenever the chaos, well, if ever, I think it's a whenever, right? The chaos dwarfs are added to the game. Those will be right here for Boris Ursus to play with. Um, but also, if you kind of get an orientation of where he starts, here's the World's Edge Mountain. Here's the Eastern Oblast and the Northern Oblast, as well as Troll Country right there. So, uh, Katarine is over in this direction. I think it's like right there. And then uh, Kosteltian's over here. You get the Demon Prince in this location, as well as Kugoth Plaguefather over here. Greasus is somewhere in this direction. And then you've got all of Cathay. So just to give you a little bit of an orientation on where he starts in the map, to kind of give you a good balance here. But moving into his mechanics, um, it's worth noting that Boris Ursus doesn't get any unique mechanics that the other two legendary lords get. In fact, all three share the same faction mechanics, just like Cathay does. So just to kind of make that uh, point up front. So for faction effects, we get the High Priest of Ursin, Diplomatic Relations plus 30 with the faction of the Ice Court, which makes sense because that's his daughter. Construction cost minus 50% for garrison and religion buildings. Construction time minus one for province our provincial capital and settlement buildings and then recruitment rank plus two for war bear riders that's obviously going to be your focus here for urson so with the urson revivalists we also have climate specializations or uh, suitable climates which is frozen wasteland mountain and temperate unpleasant is going to be chaotic wasteland temperate island savanna and jungle uninhabitable is going to be magical forest ocean and desert and that is our little breakdown here for uh, Boris Ursus's little faction. I, <laughs> I say little faction, like oh. your little paltry faction. So looking at his motherland mechanic, um, I will say almost everything is exactly identical across all three lords for the exception of this supporter section, which we'll go into in just a second here. So the, to start off for the motherland, we have the four invocations. Now the way that these work is, you'll select an invocation and you'll press invoke 
you'll pay the devotion cost and then that will last for 10 turns now when you invoke a specific god one of the uh, four chief gods of kislev um you've got that buff like i said for 10 turns but if you decide to say hey you know i've invoked salyak i've had it for eight turns but i want to now take the invocation of dodge if you choose to invoke dodge it would overwrite salyak you don't get them uh you don't get salyak for like two more turns and then uh, uh dodge for the remaining 10 it's just you choose one and it overwrites the other so you're you're choosing a full-on invocation and all of these invocations cost Devotion. Defending Kislev against the forces of chaos will produce devotion, along with pious buildings. Consume your devotion by invoking the motherland, which will bolster your territory and allow the gain of supporters. Supporters? Supporters. <laughs> you gain them by certain buildings. Um, a lot of buildings will actually grant you uh, a good amount of devotion. Certain events, character skills, uh, fighting chaos, and you can also have a post-battle option that whenever you kill chaos, you can either, hey, I'm going to let captives go it's going to give me money i'm going to get unit replenishment or i can sacrifice them to the kislev gods giving you devotion you get certain hero actions that will grant you more devotion um and then there are also technology and you would use it when you build buildings declare war on kislev that that's a big thing uh, events invoking the motherland and technology so that is your one currency the other one is supporters which we'll go into in just a little bit so for our four invocations we get salyak which is going to give you one supporter when gaining a character rank 20 growth and eight percent casualty replenishment dodge is going to give you one supporter when constructing a building just as a note you have to complete the building if it says it takes three turns to make you click that button wait three turns and once it is fully constructed you'll get that supporter Income from trade plus 15% as well as from all buildings plus 8%. Urson here is going to give you uh, five supporters when occupying a settlement. Causes attrition to enemy armies within your territory. Then the army bitter ability, the bitterness of winter, which drains vigor, reduces speed, and lowers leadership. And a 35 meter radius here, and you get three charges of it. Then you get Tor, which is going to give you two supporters when fighting a battle. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, any battle. And then army ability, Wrath of the Bear. This is going to increase your AP and base weapon damage by 50% with a 3 charge as well. And then melee attack plus 5% for all armies. And again, you would just simply click this and press invoke. And it would cost 88 devotion. Pull it from my pool and you're good to go. Now, the supporters thing here is, if you've ever played Total War Saga Troy, you might recognize this bar right here. It's the same exact one from the game. It's just horizontal instead of vertical and it doesn't have Hector and Troy it has Katarine at the top and then Kosteltian at the bottom now for the other two legendary lords you use devotion or money to lower the support of the other for Boris you're going to use your supporters to either support the ice court or support the orthodoxy it's all you'll be doing and as you move your way up this you'll get different bonuses. So those supporters, you gain them from buildings, events, fighting chaos, and then invoking the motherland. But you lose them from certain events and fighting Kislev. Anytime you get in a fight with Kislev, you, use, you lose two supporters. So it can be pretty brutal. You can offset that, of course, by using Tor, which will give you two supporters when fighting a battle. So in case you are stuck with a war with another Kislevite, you can offset this supporter reduction. So going through here, we get the early ground swell. Now this is going to be your bonuses of diplomatic relations, control, leadership, and speed, which will increase as you go up to growing influence, to increasing popularity, establishing dominance, and then lastly, loyalist supremacy. As the player, you will confederate your political opponent. You'll basically just take them into your faction. Now, this is only for those two factions. It does not affect you as Boris. If you support them all the way to the end, it doesn't mean that they, they are going to join your faction. This is for the Ice Court and the Great Orthodoxy. And of course, a ton of diplomatic relation, control, leadership, and speed. But that is your motherland mechanic here for Kislev. And it is worth noting, too, that this Invocations and the Devotion plays into another mechanic here with the um, uh, Chaos Incursions. So right now it says, Devotion is low. There's a small chance of a Chaos Incursion appearing in your land. And this symbol will be one of two symbols. Either this little, like, Chaos Demon symbol up here at the top, or it'll be a little shield. And it'll say, like, hey, your Devotion is super high. Don't worry about it. They're not going to incur upon, upon ye. 
If you do get a chaos incursion, depending upon how low your devotion devotion is, you might have a large incursion or a small incursion. And those incursions will just pop up randomly in your land, and you'll have to go defeat that chaos incursion wherever it is. So that is one of the mechanics that is across all of the individuals of uh, uh, Kislev. So just to kind of go into those. Now we've got two other big mechanics I want to jump into in the Ice Court and the Atomans. Now these are going to be mirrored across all three Legendary Lords. So I'm going to film this on one of these campaign overview videos. So if you're watching this, say for any of the other ones coming up, it's just going to be the same footage. Moving into the Ice Court, we have the ability to train up your heroes and lords that are, well, coming from the Ice Court, your Frost Maidens and your Ice Witches. Now, these characters, you'll have to actually unlock the specific technologies to actually go ahead and train them up. And once you do, you spend some money, they jump into this little slot, and they'll be training there for, say, eight turns. Now, during that process, and I don't want to show it to you because I don't want to spoil it. It's a very fun little kind of build your own hero, build your own lord kind of process. Not in the same way as the Demon Prince. You just have these dilemmas that you'll be faced with that will help shape the character as they come into the game. And they'll get a lot of traits that will then be applied. Stuff like minus four to corruption or increasing control or increasing the melee attack of your entire army. So you can decide, is this going to be a hero that mainly goes around the campaign map supporting you? Is it going to be a hero that supports your army? Is this going to be a brand new lore that is meant to push your frontier? Or is it a lore that's maybe meant to stay domestically and help support growing your faction? That's the kind of cool thing about the Ice Court is you get to build these heroes and lords out before they even come into the game. It is a brand new mechanic here, and as you uh, research them, you'll be able to unlock more and more of their presence in your campaign for whatever legendary lord you're playing for Kislev. Jumping forward a little bit, we have the Adamans mechanic for all three of your legendary lords for Kislev. And the way that this works here is that you need to have at least two provinces, because for every two, you get access to an Adaman. Assign an Adaman to govern a province, conferring bonus effects. One Adaman can be assigned for every two provinces that you own. And you've got your list of Adamans right here. You've got your provinces on the map, and you just simply click this to assign them. But above these little assigning portholes, you have got these flags, and that's going to give you your income, your control, your growth, and then your corruption details. So basically what's going on in those provinces. Then you'll see on this case over here, this little red next to it shows what the adamant is influencing. He's giving plus five to income and plus 10 to growth. Looking over at all of our available adamants, you can see that there's other ones that give just simply corruption, reduction. Some give you growth and corruption reduction. This one just gives you a ton of income. It's whatever you want to focus on is the adamant that you would then place in that slot. It takes a turn for it to get there and then it pops in. So here's some of the cool things though about that adamant, because just like the ice court, you're gonna be dealing with dilemmas every handful of turns. And those dilemmas are gonna confer these passive bonuses onto the adamants. Stuff like, oh, here's an increase to the control that they help out with. Or this will actually give them a military bonus and help out with melee attack for the entire army. You're basically getting a whole ton of these passive bonuses onto the adamant over time. But in desperate times, you can actually pull them out from their position as an adamant onto the battlefield as a set boyar lord. The thing to kind of keep in mind with this is they will recruit at the rank of one or if you have a bunch of technologies and skills that would increase your lord rank that would help increase it but even if they have a ton of adamant abilities um, they still will come out at rank one but the nice thing is that they will not have an upkeep on them until you pull them out so a lot of play uh, players that go through Total War, they might choose to have a legendary lord that stays domestically and boosts the economy, right? Just a lot of control or a lot of corruption reduction, whatever it is. But you unfortunately have to deal with your supply lines and the upkeep that that lord would cost you. The Adamant does not unless we jump down into our city, we press recruit lord, and you see we've got our standard boyars. We we'll click Adamant. We now have the Adamant we can just pull into 
our lands here, right? So you can see it's going to cost us just a 245. We there's no actual cost association with him um, in this screen, so it's quite, it's quite nice to just kind of jump this guy into the battlefield whenever you want. In addition to after his amount of turns, if you dismiss him, you can put him back to Adam if you so wish. But in the meantime, you can just simply appoint another one from the list on the left over here. So that is the new Adamans mechanic here for Total War Warhammer 3 in Kislev. Moving into the character skills for Boris Ursus, we have got quite a bit to go into here. And as you can see, he looks sick. With his little throwing hatchet and beautiful glaive. So for his uh, active abilities, we have Fury of Ursum, which is going to give him 25% AP and base damage, as well as can cause terror and rampages him for 18 seconds. But then his typical passive abilities of Encourage, Hide and Forest, By Our Blood, which we'll go into in the battle section. And then since he's an individual... Uh, single entity unit he gets wounds and missile resistance of 15 percent looking at his traits he gets the red czar which is going to reduce his upkeep for war bear rider units in his army only leadership plus seven when fighting against warriors of chaos demons of chaos and norska same of plus nine melee attack of those same opponents so those are all of his just kind of base stuff um, as far as his stats go to He's pretty girthy. 50 melee attack, 55 melee defense, with a nice, a, a, a nice, with a nice amount of weapon strength at 323, with 225 AP and 25 bonus versus large, and a good amount of armor at 85 with 3500 health. Moving into his actual skills here, you can see his blue line is the same as you would expect for any character. It's got a route marcher, control, uh, recruitment cost reduction, attrition, and corruption reduction into draft master recruitment rank and local recruitment capacity increase lightning strike and as i've mentioned pretty much with every video this will now increase the enemy battle reinforcement time by 50 percent or you can enable the old school lightning strike ability from warhammer 1 and 2 if you do this will make it so that you cut off reinforcements but your army will come into the uh, battle a little exhausted with lower vigor you get Quartermaster here for upkeep, casualty replenishment rate, as well as ambush defense chance. And then lastly, you're renowned and feared, which is going to help out with upkeep, campaign movement, hero self-defense, hero action success, and then, I'm sorry, hero action success chance reduction, and then Lord Recruitment Rank, uh, plus, I'm sorry, Recruitment Rank plus one for the Lord's Army. Um, for the red line, again, standard fare here. Remember, this is the new inspiring presence of Warhammer 3, so this gives you unit experience gain plus 75 per turn, but for firing drills, it's going to help out with your Kossars, Armored Kossars, and Streltsy. Your Best of the Court is going to help with Zargard and Iceguard. Relentless Charge is going to apply to Kossavite Dervishes, Winged Lancers, and Griffin Legions. Creatures of the Land is going to be your War Bear Riders, Elemental Bears, and Snow Leopards, and then Skilled Craftsmen is going to help with War Sleds and Little Grom. You get Rally, then your four abilities that are going to apply to the rank seven variants of everything we just mentioned. Then stand your ground. And for his red line, it's just exactly the same as it is for pretty much everyone when it comes to a standard fair red line. But just to kind of hover over these really quick so that you can see them. Foe Seeker's on here as well. Weapon strength, melee attack, leadership, melee defense, and then deadly onslaught. Now for his unique skills, we get Stout Hearted. It's going to help with hit points and leadership. Fearless Fighter is going to give him an additional 24 bonus versus large. And then Immune to Psych. Brother of Bears is going to give him weapon strength of 16% for War Bear Riders and Elemental Bear units, which is lovely because he starts with two War Bears, as you can see down here. This is his starting army. Band of Brutes, uh, which is six leadership for Zargard and weapon strength 10% for Zargard units. Um, just kind of think of these things, how you can stack this together, right? Uh, this is great. So he's going to be able to do melee attack, melee defense, missile strength, and leadership and weapon strength for Zargard units. And Brotherhood of Bear, I'm sorry, Brotherhood of Bears, gets that 16% for War Bear Riders and Elemental Bears, which you can then further increase with an additional 12% from this bonus. So a lot of really great ways to increase your War Bears on top of the... Um, the innate bonus that you get from the faction itself. The Great Reclaimer here is going to help out with campaign movement range increased by 10%. Then Elemental Regeneration grants regen for Elemental Bear units in the Lord's Army. In fact, actually, I think it was... Yeah, melee attack and upkeep. Okay, just making sure. And you're also reducing your upkeep for your War Bears. Now, for mounts here, we get War Horse and then Erskine, his, in, his special um, War Bear. I have not seen this do anything special or different than any other warbear. I think it's just named Erskine and it has a little bit different of a skin. Brass Lunged. 
heroic resilience, which is uh, unique to all boyars, um, including, of course, Boris Ursus, which is a passive ability of increased melee defense and leadership when hit points are less than 50%. As uh, Kislev gets weaker, they actually get stronger. Health-wise weaker. Resettler gives him growth plus 10 and no colonization cost faction-wide, which is nice in the starting location for Boris because a lot of things around him are either Skaven infested or in ruins. As one with Urson helps out with character's aura leadership effect plus 5 and enemy leadership minus 8, which you lose 8 leadership as well. Grand Builder helps with construction cost reduction for all buildings and the time reduction for garrison and religion buildings minus 50%, stacking with that faction effect. And then lastly, Khan King here is going to help Motherland invocation cost minus 10% and diplomatic relations plus 30 Into his two quest items, they are not quests. I'll say that up front. When you reach rank 7, the next turn you'll get the Shard Blade. And when you reach rank 10, the next turn you'll get the Armor of Urson. The Shard Blade here, though, reduces corruption. Recruitment cost minus 10%. Melee attack plus 6. Gives you uh, magical attacks, which you already had to start, but just in case you wanted them anyway. Bonus versus large. An additional 12. So let's just count that up real, qu real quick. Your base, 25, plus... 12 plus an additional what 20 or 24 here so you can be a bonus versus large monster you are meant to kill demons then ability shard blade reduces speed and does damage effect here um and it is quite nice for our 15 meter radius here um into the armor of urson we get the bonus of 10 more armor enemy hero action success chance minus 10 percent wound recovery time minus one melee defense plus Eight, and then ability armor of Urson, giving you 18% base and weapon damage, as well as plus 12 melee attack here, enabled if hit points less than 50%. So like I said, the weaker you get health-wise in Kislev, the stronger you become. Let's jump over to some quick little facts about the Ice Witch and the Patriarch for Kislev before we move into some combat mechanics. And just to quickly show this portion off, um, just like it is true for every other character in Kislev, the Frost Maidens all get access to the Guardian's Call ability, which allows them to summon a Snow Leopard. And as you progress through the ranks, it'll get bonuses like increased melee attack and defense. And lastly, it'll get the, the biggest bonus to greatly increased melee attack and melee defense. But just to show these um, characters off for Kislev as they do have some great abilities here, just to kind of hover over these. And then for the hero, the other hero, we have got the Patriarch, which has access to the um, individual um, buffs, the individual prayers. But they also get, just like the Ice Witches do, these kind of specializations. And just to kind of hover over these really quick for you. That covers all of the unique skills and whatnot for this character. Let's go ahead and move on into some battle stuff. Curveball, I've lied to you, we're actually talking about technology next. So the research tree for Kislev is split into four different trees. And you've got one for the land that you'll always have access to, one for Kislev, one for Erengrad, and then another one for Prague. And the top location for, I'm sorry, the top portion of each location you, everyone has access to, but you need to research five of the top portion of Prague, Erengrad, or Kislev, and then you get access to the more advanced technologies at the bottom only if you actually hold that respective location. So, for example, if I jump through five of these technologies in Erengrad and I own Erengrad, I can then research these six technologies at the bottom. And some of them are very, very good. Um, is it Kislev? Yeah, Kislevian, Kislevian Dukit will give you income from trade uh, good producing buildings plus 100 percent so these all working in tandem allow for kislev to have a just disgusting amount of income and i cannot tell you how hard that goes like erengrad is your chief port city and once you get access to it every single time you increase a specific building there it adds another tradable resource i think it starts with just hides then it goes up to something like uh, iron is your next one so you have iron and hides from one building then i think it's like pottery or, or or marble whatever it is you just keep stacking all these tradable things so 
all this stuff works in conjunction very well. Um, and on top of it, it does give you a, a kind of drive to get to these. Because if I say I'm playing as, let's say I'm playing as Boris, right? And I want really good war bears. Well, the only way to get, only way to get bear baiting, which gives a frenzy to your war bear riders, is to hold Kislev, right? Or let's say you want really good ice guard. Well, Again, Mesh Layers, which is going to give Missile Resistance for Kossars, Armored Kossars, Threltsy, and Ice Guard units, that's here in Kislev. Um, or if I look across the way, Siege Mentality gives melee defense under siege, ammunition for all the aforementioned units I just talked about, and reload time reduction when I own Prog. So you really need to kind of decide how you're going to select these individual locations, right? Because getting them is going to be chief to your campaign. It's a big driving force for you is to unite all of Kislev, but it gives you access to much better technologies throughout Kislev. And the last ones here on the land, everyone can do. You just simply need to have access to them. But you'll see that there are four technologies that require devotion. And each one of these will upgrade the respective invocation of the motherland that they correspond to. So this one, Dodge Cult Customs, upgrades Dodge Invocation of the Motherland, increases income from all buildings and trade, and adds the Land Awakened Army ability. Or this one, increases capture of punishment, growth, and control of all provinces. Just to kind of show these off real quick, melee attack of all units, and this one will help out with melee defense of all armies. So this is your technology tree for Kislev. For unique combat mechanics for Kislev, like I've said before, Kislev gets stronger the weaker that they become. So taking a look over here at Boris, we're going to bring up his little scroll. Actually, you know what? We'll do it for the War Bears. We haven't taken a look at them yet, and they look pretty spiffy. You get the Buy Our Blood passive ability. So the way that this works is once the leadership is wavering or particularly low for a unit, for 30 seconds, they will become unbreakable. So it really allows you to hold that line for you to either reinforce or to get a character over there to help out with leadership, whatever it is to kind of help prevent your models from capitulating. It is a great way to kind of keep the line going so that you have a lot of stuff going on. Now, the big thing to just kind of note about Kislev's military is it is almost entirely filled with hybrid units. The Kossars, the Armored Kossars, the Tsar Guard, the Ice Guard, all of your infantry are in some way, shape, or form a hybrid, a hybrid unit. The Kossars here have bows and axes, or bows and spears. The Armored Kossars have pistols and uh, swords and shields or great weapons. The Ice Guard have magical bows and arrows, as well as glaives or dual swords. While not a unique mechanic, it was still one I wanted to bring up here because it might seem like, you know what, by our blood is the only mechanic they get while everyone else gets a whole ton of other ones. It just depends upon the skills of the legendary lord you're playing that can help leverage some additional benefits towards when your character gets weaker. Like we've seen with Boris, he get I'm sorry, your army gets weaker. We've seen a lot of stuff that will help your army as they lower their health, they'll get a lot of benefits uh, to certain specific things. So these are some of your unique combat mechanics for Kislev. So now that we've talked about all of Boris Ursus's campaign mechanics as well as how Kislev's campaign mechanics work, the real question here is how does this campaign play? What's the kind of overall feel for it and is it right for me? Well, one thing to kind of consider here is Boris Ursus, even though he's the first one that we're chronologically talking about of the three legendary lords for Kislev, he's the last one you're going to unlock, right? You're going to either play as Kosteltian or as Katarine first, and then you'll very eventually get to Boris. And we've already gone through how to unlock this bad boy. And once you do, you'll be starting in a location that is different than the other two legendary lords, right? This is where Kislev is. You're all the way over here. And in the current state of the game, because there's no DLCs, there's no additional faction lords as of the recording of this video, there are very few direct oppositions for Boris Ursus in this location. So once you've done a lot of stuff with Kislev and you want to play a Kislev campaign, which is essentially you painting the Darklands in the, in the colors of Kislev, then, then Boris is going to be for you because this is the only character of the three that is a pure combat character and he is a powerhouse he is an absolute destroyer of worlds when it comes to fighting against other large creatures as you've seen right he gets that base 27 bonus versus large 
plus an additional 24, plus an additional 12 from his uh, shard blade. So you're looking at a disgusting amount of bonus versus large. He rips through other greater demons quite easily with all of his abilities when he gets on his war bear. So kind of putting these things together, you get a very strong character in Boris. And you don't necessarily have to interact with the supporters portion of the uh, Motherland mechanic like you do when you're playing as either Katarine or as Kosteltian. So if you've already played those campaigns and you're like, oh man, I kind of just want to kick some serious ass as Boris or as, an, as Kislev, then this is the one that's going to be for you because you'll just be on a rampage ripping through the entirety of the Darklands, creating your own Kislevite empire on the other end of the World's Edge Mountains, which makes it a really fun and cool campaign. But as a heads up, that will probably change when we start to get other lords added into the Darklands. Like if we're thinking about the Chaos Dwarfs and we take a look at Tsar Nagrun being right over here. And then we get uh, the Black Fortress right over here. And we get the Tower of Gorgoth and the Mines of Morgoth. Or Gorgoth. These are pivotal locations across Darklands that will probably eventually be inhabited by Chaos Dwarfs. Again, making for a much different Kislev campaign, even if we're thinking about the future. You're not going to be dealing with the machinations of chaos so much as fighting for survival pinched across so many other deadly legendary lords that will probably come to inhabit the Darklands in the distant future of Total War Warhammer 3. So hopefully this gives you a good idea of how Boris Ursus will play and how Kislev plays in Total War. If you have any questions or there's anything I maybe didn't go over or just kind of general concerns about the campaign, by all means, go ahead and let me know in the comments section below. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.